will work. Is this good? For the make sure. this time? Is it further? Where yeah, did it? Because it was like here. Was last here time. last yeah. time? It and worked out okay. Batteries angling it so you can see your face. Oh, I can still do that. <laughs> Although the batteries I have this time, I changed already. So hopefully they are new and it will stay on. I could use my lifesavers instead. True. <laughs> Make it a little higher. I think I turned it on. Yeah, it's going. It's good. Good. <laughs> so good evening. We have 15 meetings for the semester. This is our second one. Because we're we meet for three hours and 45 minutes, which is from what I understand, we get 45 minutes of good brain attention, and then we get bored because we run out of what makes the brain run. Mm -hmm. So, protein, apparently. So, I, any of you vegan? Vegetarians? I tried once. <laughs> so, do you get tired faster mentally? No, I'm not vegan anymore. <laughs> You gave it up. Mm. But that's just, I've never been a vegan. I've always eaten something. Dead animals are my favorite, <laughs> usually. Um, OK, so a couple of interesting things. Um, let's see if anyone's here that had a question last time. No. Um, quiz questions, I thought your responses to those were Normal, <laughs> actually, because uh, I've, I've done that for quite a long time. And so the amount of uh, commandments that people remembered, uh, about the same, uh, it's kind of interesting. It depends on where in town you live. Uh, people tend to remember more than the further out towards Wasilla uh, you go, which is kind of interesting if you think of it. Um, uh, and also the, the tendency to invent new ones is pretty interesting. I like that, um, especially considering a lot of them are Alaskan-based. I don't know if you read uh, some of, of the ones I've added to my, my list, um, but that's, that's kind of fun. Um, and the other one, uh, who would go with Jesus? That's an amazing uh, question and really ties into... Uh, the meaning of lives that we begin with tonight. Uh, because if you think of it, what's, what Jesus in that hypothetical question is, is suggesting is that um, you're living the wrong kind of life if what you're doing is focusing on being a consumer and having stuff, etc. But that the more meaningful life is essentially going with him. And, and perhaps we know uh, what he means by that, perhaps not, uh, depends on what your experience is. Certainly for almost 2,000 years, people have been behaving as if they understand what he's asking of us, right? And by the way, that's supposedly a real question, because it's uh, based on a quotation of uh, uh, something Jesus said in uh, the New Testament, right? So... If you hear people quoting what Jesus said in the Old Testament, you know they're wrong, right? You know, that's the same thing as Abraham Lincoln pointing out that you can't trust everything you hear on the Internet, you know, because, of course, that would be also wrong, right? Because um, the Internet was invented by Vice President Al Gore, according to Al Gore, right? <laughs> and uh, Al Gore uh, wasn't his vice president, he was uh, much later. Um, so in any case, um, it's a real question, I think. And I know a lot of people uh, have actually uh, tried to live the kind of life that it's understood that Jesus uh, was asking people to live. And, and that's uh, usually the orders. Uh, they're like the order of St. Augustine, the order of... Um, uh, St. Dominic, uh, uh, there's uh, what, 
maybe 20 or more, I don't know how many orders there are. Actually, I've never tried to count them. We have some nuns living in Anchorage who are nuns that have taken vows of poverty and, uh, um, uh, and so on and live in a home in Anchorage, kind of up on the hillside, I think. Uh, I've never visited there, but I believe it's near that little um, uh, uh, place where you could go for weekends and things. Um, and they're, they're not allowed out of the house. Uh, people bring them things. You can't really visit them. I think you can talk to them through a window, but I've never, never done that. So, so there are folks that today still uh, do what they think uh, Jesus was asking them to do. It's kind of amazing. I remember as a kid, though, that um, uh, I was in a Roman Catholic high school. A lot of my friends were interested in going to seminary. We would have gone to St. Mary's at Villanova. I was actually there, went behind the bars. There are bars there. But not drinking bars, but the kind that you can't get out of, right? And, you know, and that's kind of interesting. A lot of my teachers went there. Um, uh, they become philosophy majors. Notice I became a philosophy major myself, but I didn't go to the seminary, so it's kind of interesting. But yes, I was, I was really close to wanting to do that, thinking that that was the right, right thing to do, because that's the way I was taught as a child, that, that the holy life was literally, you know, trying to live the ascetic life a sacrifice just dedicated to God, right? And very few of you actually said that you would go with him uh, in this hypothetical question. And I think that's indicative of us living in America, uh, living at a time, I, I mean, some of you said, you drop, faith, well, I'm off, off you go, right? Uh, because he's God, that was the hy hypothetical. Others Literally, even though the hypothesis says he is, he is God. And your response was, well, would it be as good a life as what I have now? I mean, he'd have to persuade me to think, you know, that I would, I would be better off. Right? So it's not a matter of the meaning of my life, really, uh, and what I'm sacrificing for other people or what I'm, what I'm trying to dedicate my life to. It's instead a matter of, you know, would it, would it be better for me, and especially for my kids and things of that sort, right? So, and I, I'm not sure that Jesus really meant it for women. I, you know, that's, you know, if you think of it, as, and especially, what, zero, well, 33 B.C., or rather A.D., sorry. I'm losing my mind, I guess. What was you know the the attitude towards women? I mean, remember Mary Magdalene was considered a prostitute because she would come to dinner and have conversations with him, right? You know, so that was totally wrong for a woman to participate in that. Now, what wasn't just that culture? So could Jesus have been talking about women, especially if they were mothers with children? Not sure. Hmm. Did you have any thoughts on those that you'd like to share? By the way, I'm not suggesting that we should do what Jesus says. For one, you'd have to believe that Jesus was God, or at least a significant prophet, and had a real clue. I mean, remember the question we had uh, that prompted this was Socrates' question in the Euthyphro, where he's asking Euthyphro to, de to define what it means to be pious. Is the pious pious because the gods love it, or is do the gods love the pious because it's pious? Right. So is Jesus asking you to give up everything because that's the right way to live? somehow, right? And, and how, would you, how would you discover that? Um, or was it just his favorite 
way of living. As opposed to you know, having a swimming pool, car in the garage, etc. You know, is that what? I'm, sorry, I'm thinking of King Herod. You know, if you are the Christ, you're the great Jesus Christ. Walk across my swimming pool, right? Yeah. Did you um, see the um, Randy Rainbow edition of that? You might want to I did not. Yes. I did not. Just not that I know of, anyway. That's meant for only your ears, no one else. Randy Rainbow. Oh, anybody, don't, anybody else? <laughs> They're supposedly all adults. It's about Trump. That's right. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. Maybe I shouldn't see it, you know. I'm trying to remain neutral. That's really difficult. Mm -hmm. you, you see all the things that happen, especially with magic mark, not magic markers. What? That's. Okay. Well, so uh, tonight's question, I think I, I'll, I'll go ahead with the, the quiz question uh, to start because I don't want to forget the wonderful question that uh, uh, came up as I was playing a couple melodies that I think we might use later on in the class. Uh, and that is, what is your favorite song? What is your favorite song? What if you don't have one? You can say that. That I don't have any favorite song. I hate music. No, I don't know what, what, what you're. Say what you think. And there is no right answer. I hope. Remember, this is philosophy class. Strictly speaking, there is no correct answer. What would a correct answer be? It would have to be something that's true, right? And what makes something true? This is really fun, because I have lawyers who are, are friends of mine, and that was a real surprise, what true is. Yes? Is that the second question, for the quiz question? No. Oh, okay. So just the first one so far. Okay. We'll make up another one as we go. But the first one, what is your favorite song? But as an interesting uh, start to tonight's discussion, um, the meaning of lives. She, she, Susan Wolf. If you've had a chance uh, to read this, uh, the lecture or panel discussion uh, at Princeton. The the link. I hope you had a chance to watch watch it. I have those links there. Hopefully, you, you get a chance to use those. That's primarily there because that's Susan Wolf. So, if you're curious who Susan Wolf is, since you've read the article. Uh, you can see her uh, there uh, with a couple uh, of the faculty members of Princeton, which, by the way, it's a crappy little university in New Jersey. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to be there. Um, I bought a sweatshirt there at their bookstore, and it was the crappiest bookstore I've ever been in. It smelled moldy, and it was down in, like, the basement, and... But the one good thing about it is from the back windows, I could see where John Nash threw his desk out his dorm window. That building, at least in the movie. I don't know if he ever really did that. But if you saw A Beautiful Mind, that movie with John Nash, where he and his roommate. Did it, any of you see the movie? Yes? You know he didn't really have a roommate. <laughs> Right, <laughs> but he and his roommate threw his his desk out the window, and that was right there where very iconic spot on on Princeton. But so you get to to see three faculty members uh, discussing the book uh, of the year for the incoming class of 2018, and how many of you have even heard of the books of the year uh, for UAA? Ever heard of them? I pulled up the page. Believe it or not, we have a, a, a program uh, that encourages the entire community to read a, set, a, a book or a set of books 
with the idea that the whole community could all participate in an ongoing conversation about those. This is the, I, I believe these are all for this year, and I've read two of them, and not everybody agrees with those, by the way. Um, I didn't really agree with Naomi Klein, but it was still an interesting. This changes everything. She's talking about the um, global warming. And of course, not everyone agrees that global warming is man-made. That's, I guess, I guess, the main issue. It's pretty obvious to us here uh, that the weather is changing, right? But is it a man-made dilemma, or is it the sun go? You know, who knows, right? Uh, but so, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, I haven't read the others, but these are the the books of the year. If you're in the library, the consortium library, as you go in, they're they're all there. Uh, you could tell they're the books that there's like 40 or 50 copies of them each, so that if everybody starts reading them, they won't all be gone. You'll still be able to just check one out, etc. That's where they are. Um, but so Susan Wolfe's book was the book that Princeton picked uh, for, for the book of the year. And so this is their first uh, uh, session for the freshmen entering uh, to discuss her book. Uh, and then they have three faculty members to ask her questions. My favorite is Eddie G Gloud. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to listen uh, to that. But Eddie is really quite fascinating. Um, and we can also, I think, take one of the points they make uh, from the myth of the Sisyphus. Notice I said Sisyphus. I didn't make a mistake the way Eddie did. If you watch the video, he accidentally said syphilis. <laughs> so, so that's... It's an endless struggle. <laughs> I suppose I could find that spot. I don't know if that would be worth doing or not. This evening, we have the wonderful opportunity to kick off the semester by hearing from Professor Susan Wolf herself. She will be followed by three Princeton faculty members who will comment on her book's argument. Here's the format we're going to use. After I introduce fascinating about this momentary convergence between James and our reading today is that James was wholly preoccupied with the question of religion. He sought to hold off a quick and easy dismissal by science of religious resources for meaning and to insist that religion rightly understood affords us a way of seeing and being in the world that materialist accounts simply miss. But religion, and here's my question, at least on my reading, from Professor Wilson. Here's a brief mention of the theologian, along with the therapist, on page 7. The theologian returns again on page 12 with therapists again and motivational speakers to encourage us to find our passions. The religious view shows up in a sentence on page 59, only to immediately confront Nietzsche. And and there is her use of the word secular on page 62, which is doing some work, but I'm not quite sure what it is. So how are we to think about religion in the context of Professor Wolf's account about meaningfulness with its demand for subjective attractions and objective attract attractiveness? How might we think of syphilis, sy syphilis, Lord have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> See, if I accidentally say the word syphilis, I actually did it on purpose. <laughs> so I, I love throwing out Freudian slips that uh, are mostly pink. <laughs> no, just kidding. No, I've, I've, learned, I've learned that as long as you have lots of subliminal sexual metaphors, people tend to stay awake longer. Uh, <laughs> But they have to be subliminal. You can't be, you know, overt, you know, or, or, or it gets you fired. Not <laughs> at, at least uh, I can't teach at Chugiak High School anymore. 
Let's put it that way. <laughs> it's my interpretation of um, of mice and men. So, but that was that was many years ago. Um, okay. So the question I ask is, what is true? And this, believe it or not, a lot of people, if you haven't studied logic, and I don't know what other courses might be important for that, and I get to teach logic as one of the other things I do, um, a true sentence is actually sort of peculiar. Um, I think most of the sentences we say are neither true nor false. Let's see if I can find additional square proposition. So, can you see that from where you're sitting? Yes, you see it? Okay, so there's four types of statements. These go back to Aristotle, so this is about 2,400 years old. Um, uh, obviously, it was Greek, not English, right? Uh, but every subject is predicate, is called an A statement. No subject is predicate is called an E statement. You ever heard this before? Okay. Some subject is predicate is called an I statement. Some subject is not predicate is an O statement. The reason they're labeled A, E, I, O, the A, I are both from the Latin word affirmo, which means I affirm, so they're both positive, affirming, right? Nego, N-E-G-O, means I deny, and so the E and the O, which are negative, right, are, are they're, that's a mnemonic for you to remember uh, which, which ones they are. The top two are universal statements. In other words, the subject is all of the members of the subject set in both of them. So all horses are animals, which is true. Yes, everybody yes. agrees, right? Yeah. Um, the E statement, no dogs are cats. True statement? Yes, okay. Um, some horses are geldings. True statement? Yes. Some horses are not geldings. True statement. Yes? I don't know enough about horses. <laughs> I don't either, actually. Um, all my, my knowledge is book learning, from what I understand. Mm. No, that's not true. Um, and by the way, all my knowledge is book learning is of the form A, so it would be an A statement. Everything that is in my knowledge is in the set of things that would be learned from books. So that was an A statement. And by the way, it's false, because I've learned some things that you, know, you don't get from books. Um, so, so this is our, our, our map uh, to the four types of statements that could be true or false. And then there's problems with this. Well, you can say, yippee. So I can say yippee, and it means something, but it's neither true nor false. Pretty obvious, mm -hmm. right? I could ask you a question, how old are you? you don't answer that. Um, notice that's not a statement that is true or false. It's a question, right? Also, imperatives, shut the door, right? Not true or false, right? So there are a lot of things we could say that are neither true nor false. Statements that can be true or false have to be of this format or compounds of them. 
So I can say all horses are animals and all cows are ducks. And that whole compound statement is false, even though all horses are animals because cows are not ducks. And I said N, which means you have to have it true with both statements for the whole statement, compound statement, to be true, right? So you, just, you get the idea how this works. There are some more modern problems with this, uh, and that is um, this is a cup. This is a cup, true statement. Everybody agrees? Mm -hmm. This is a good cup. Some people are going to say no, and some people are going to say yes. So adding a valuative phrase in there, or making it a valuative statement, takes it out of the possibility of being true or false. It instead is non-cognitive. It's neither true nor false. Scientists can't evaluate my statement and determine whether the statement was true or false, because we'll have a difference of opinion. Some people will be neutral, some people say yes, some people say no. And I can't tell the people that disagree that it's not, that they're wrong, right? Because it's not. So it's not a scientific statement, so to speak, right? It's not something you could empirically evaluate and see if the statement's true or false. So when I, I ask, you know, what's true or false, it's kind of a basic question, uh, but unless you've had at least familiarity with grammar and that kind of uh, issue, you might not offhand know uh, what we very seriously mean is a true or false statement. So when Susan Wolf says the question, what's the meaning of lives, or, or, or just really, does life have any meaning? Right? What's the meaning of, of your life? Right? She is basically going to argue what? That there's something wrong with that question, right? And what's wrong with the question? There's no true answer to it? There's no true answer to it. No right or wrong to that. People that have lots of opinions, and I can't tell you, well, you're, Jesus, you're wrong. Right? You want me to go follow you, and, and what? <laughs> Is it fish and chips? The whole rest of the, you know, what are we doing? You know, you know, sandals? You know, you realize, Jesus, sandals are not going to work here in Alaska. Right? You know. I don't know, I see people in flip-flops in February. <sighs> That's, yeah, I suppose you could learn to do that. That's me. I'm that person. Yeah. I'm that person. Yeah. I also see it, people upside down in the ditch. <laughs> With the feet decision. sticking up, you know. Flip-flops. <laughs> totally, this is all of a sudden a sad thing. I just heard that one of the bodies the helicopter photographed in uh, um, the Bahamas was a man lying under a pile of debris with his two arms sticking up. Sad. But you know, I'm thinking your feet sticking up. And an instant reminder of what I just saw on TV about 5.30. Clarification. So when you're talking about the cup being good, right, and someone else might say, well, I don't think it's good, and you responded by saying that particular type of statement may not be neither, it may be neither true nor false, right? Right. It's not. So I guess to clarify for me, I'm thinking, well, for me, it's true. Right. That makes the statement true. For that person, it's false. That makes right. the statement false. So it's true and false. Not neither nor. Well, the, the issue there, of course, is it hurts our head to say that the statement is both true and false, even though we're saying in different contexts. And we right, do, it's relative we, to the individual. It's relative. Making a statement, and a lot of. Universal, right? right, right. 
And we do say that all truth is relative to a particular context. So that complicates things even, even more uh, because, oh, go ahead, Judith. Um, well, I, I was wondering, so what if the statement was, this cup holds 12 ounces of fluid? That's, that could be measured, that, that could, yeah, this is a... So there can be facts, I mean, there can be... Oh, absolutely. We can have facts, although they're still facts in a particular context. And what we mean by that, very confusing, but requires language of some sort. All right, 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's, I think, true universally. Anybody disagree? Uh, but, but that is a particular language. I wouldn't say that's necessary English, although I used an English way of expressing that. I'm sure if you were Zwei und Zwei bist fear, right? That's not the same. Did I say that right? I don't think I said that. No. Gosh, how would you say that in German? Zwei und Zwei ist? Yes. Fear, okay. Bist. Where did that come from? Yeah. Bist? Bist. I don't know where that came from. Okay, um, so, so it's kind of interesting. Math is its own language, and it's the language that is the math, right? You know, so, so when you're seeing the symbols, that's its own language, and then we use our particular language to interpret those symbols, so that's kind of fun. But, yes, there are facts, facts within context. Uh, so football games, you have rules of the game, you know, ten, 10 yards, you have to go for a first down, all, all that sort of, th you know, all that is factual in that particular context. It could be different if it's a different uh, rule book. And then, then you have to, okay, so in this particular version of football, uh, you, you know, it's different, you know, or something, or the... the the 10 yards are different. I think there's a different version of football now that's a smaller field that I think is, is, is different. All right. So, yes, we have facts within context. Here's a perfect example of, I think, something that's very confusing this way. Um, does the earth go around the sun or does the sun go around the earth? Earth goes around the sun. Why is that funny? You're laughing. I have had folks raise their hand and say, no, it's the sun goes around the earth. Why is that not also true? Perspective. Perspective. Makes it true, actually. Right? And I was laughing because I think of what Susan Wolf uh, touches on is beyond subjective truth, there's truth within limited contexts or an individual's context of their perspective. You can have different levels of truth. The greater the span of context that something is true in, the more true it is. The more universal it yeah. is. Yeah. So if something's yeah. true for one person and something's true for a thousand people, their truth is greater. So most people think there's there's more people that the earth as going around the sun and therefore to have someone question it is funny. Like, well, this guy's also well I, I, I wasn't trying to, no, I was just trying to question it. That. I was asking which context are you using as your norm? Mm -hmm. And what's fun is that um, I, the Tychonic oh. model is probably uh, the best way of framing the Earth-centered model. See if I can find that. If you can see it, but in, in this system, so this is from Tycho Brahe. Uh, he was a contemporary of Galileo, but uh, didn't want to accept the Copernican view because, well, it didn't really work for one thing, um, uh, 
Uh, plus, you get in trouble with the church because uh, the church, of course, wanted you to make sure that you know you stuck to what the church said was true. Uh, but the neat thing about Tycho Brahe's is that the earth is still the center, but the sun and the moon go around the earth, but all the other planets and the stars go around the sun, right? So this is basically the, the mirror image of the helio, uh, or, or the, um, he, yeah, heliocentric, right? heliocentric, sun center, right? But how many other models are there today that are considered true besides these two? Uh, we have uh, the galaxy, right, a spiral galaxy going around a black hole. Yes? And the sun, our sun, is going around that. Uh, I always forget, what is it, 450 kilometers an hour, a minute? I forget, whatever it is. So we're, as a system, we're traveling around it, right? Um, there's a really horrible video here, but let's see if I can... This is really horrible, but basically, what is that? Oh, I heard that India's launch failed, by the way. If you were familiar with, India was trying to be the fourth country to um, go, to the moon. go to the moon, and it disappeared. quickly, right? But you get an idea that if you put all the, actually I think if you mapped it out correctly, you probably get the impression that all the planets are traveling in a relatively straight line along with the sun, it's moving gradually along with it, kind of like a, a set of frequencies kind of moving along. that this video shows is that if you think of the sun as traveling, obviously the planets have to be traveling along with it, as well as uh, Jupiter takes 28 years to go around its, you know, in, in its pattern. Is it the height range representing the perpendicular to the rotation of the solar system? I don't think it is accurate. Right. I think that's because just... Look at the galaxies there more or less all in line with each other as far as the, And the Earth is kind of canted differently than all the other planets for some reason. So it's just, just another model, which obviously that means that the Earth-centered model is false and the heliocentric model is also false, right? Because that's, that's actually a whole different pattern. Then we also have what's called the vacuum-centric model which points out that since some of the planets especially are, are large enough that they pull the, the sun from the center, that the center of what we would call the solar system is actually empty, a vacuum, so a vacuum-centric model, right? Then you have 
string theorists that argue that all of time and space exist at once and all motion is actually an illusion of consciousness. String theorists are great. <laughs> You're like, whoa. So that's another model that, in a particular context, is certainly true, according to those that are using that model. Plus, we know that models change over time. Galileo, you know, obviously. And what was Galileo's significant achievement? Recognizing that Venus doesn't go around the Earth. Is it of the, it, through the telescope, he could see that it had the same kind of uh, um, changes uh, that reflected that it was in different locations around the sun, and so not going around the earth. It would always look the same if it were going around the earth, theoretically, but since it doesn't, you know, then it's, it's got to be going around the sun, et cetera, right? Although he denied it, apparently, and yet as he was exiting from the trial, he, Said, and yet it still moves, or something of that sort. Who knows if he really said that or not. But they didn't burn him, so I think he probably didn't. So that's fun. But so, so how many different models are there? Um, and so we end up then with um, Stephen Hawking. May he rest in peace. And it's called um, Model Dependent. Realism. And the co author of this book was Mladenov. If you're familiar with him at all. Um, but so, model dependent realism. So, basically, because of the way human beings think. We have to have a symbolic system of some sort that we're using uh, to think in, right? Uh, and then we're using that model in order to look at our experience. And so our experience is dependent on our model. Does that make sense? That's fun. So. In this sense, we end up with this really difficult to explain situation where, yes, we want this statement to be true. And we want to say that it's true all the time in this context, but that we have other statements that are true in this context, and the contexts are different. So it looks almost like we're contradicting ourselves when I say, yes, the earth goes around the sun. Yes, the sun goes around the earth. <laughs> Look. <laughs> right? Depends on the context. Right? So it, it feels almost like you're, you know, a lot of folks get upset with people that think that truth is relative. Because you feel, you know, the, the immediate response in that situation is to say that, well, that means that there are no truths if you think it's relative. Well, but that's a false leap, I think, uh, from accepting that there are different contexts. But it really can become complex because contexts overlap. And so you get into a situation where you end up with, well, which, which way of looking at this model is going to be the best way of dealing with this situation in a, a particular... I mean, we could think of psychology this way. You know, um, I'm thinking of Foucault and his history of madness. You know, that used to be madness was interpreted as demons, you know, uh, witches. Uh, you know, then it became closer uh, to our own model, right? Uh, which now uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, if Jesus really came around and started talking to people the way he did in the Bible, somebody would call him in, and he'd probably be taken to API and given medication in order to help him. Right? I mean, if, 
If you're talking to God, and we have the funding, and that's, of course, the problem. We might not have the funding. But if we have the funding, we're probably going to pick you up for your own health uh, you know, and take you in uh, and have uh, at least a psychiatrist or two uh, spend some time with you uh, for your own good. Right? There's a, a fascinating book that's quite a few years old, but it's Julian Jaynes's book um, on uh, the bicameral mind. is, I think, from the 90s. Is the 90s a long time ago? <laughs> yeah. Well, the paperback is 2000, but I'm pretty sure that came along quite late. There's the original. That doesn't say when the original was. but um, So the, the interesting thing that he argues here is that as, now this is assuming that we evolve, that we evolve from primates, and that as our mind evolved and is bicameral, right, it has two, two rooms, right? Camera is two rooms, right? Um, and, you know, the, the um, two sides are uh, connected by the Somebody help me, I can't remember it. Corpus right. callosum. Corpus callosum, thank you. Um, 